Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a wonderful show for you this evening. The incomparable Barry and Brian Schiff are here. We're going to do a look back on 2023 in general aviation. I just cannot wait to, to spend some time with them. Before we get started, a few things. First of all, we have a winner in our Fly to Win Challenge. David Hobbs of Poplar Grove, Illinois, won a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset, and we are giving away another one on February 1st. So all you need to do in order to win one of these headsets, be entered to win, is join our Fly to Win Challenge. Download the Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices. It's completely free. Register and check in at your local airport. And then if you fly to other airports, check in, get more points. You can get on our leaderboard and get extra entries into that drawing. But you only need to check in once you're entered and you'll have an opportunity to win that fantastic prize from Lightspeed. In addition to that, it is that time of year where we come up with a very special gift and uh, the uh, opportunity to, uh, to do that. And so tonight's gift here is this uh, really, really cool, um, very heavy all metal uh, model of an aircraft. That is, I'll show you here, solar powered. All you have to do is uh, just put this on and uh, boom, solar powered. It uh, moves the propeller, very, very cool stuff. So if you're interested in supporting social flight, making all of this possible and continuing to keep it going, then it is $99 to support us with that. Uh, send an email to info at socialflight.com. That's info at socialflight.com. And uh, then uh, we'll uh, send you a link in order to purchase that and uh, help us out, and you'll be able to do that. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Avidyne, and they're simple to use yet powerful IFD 440, 540, and 550 integrated navigators. We have both the IFD 440 and the 550 in the Bonanza. And uh, I'll tell you, flying with that synthetic vision, with the built-in AHARs, we've taken it on trips uh, over to Glacier National Park and some really amazing terrain. It, it's incredible. The backup ability and the ability to use that for guidance is, is truly fantastic. And we're actually building an IFD 550 into that Mustang behind me. And uh, we're going to be using that because it, uh, we're using their feature that offers a camera integration where, where we're going to have a taxi camera. So um, very, very excited about that. And uh, uh, you can, uh, of course, reach out to Avidon, learn more about their products, and thank them for supporting Social Flight and making shows like this possible. Now, on to tonight's guests. With over 28,000 hours logged in more than 355 types of aircraft, a best-selling author with a brand new book and more awards than we have time to list, Barry Schiff is truly an aviation legend. And his son, Brian, isn't far behind. As a captain for a major US airline and one of the most innovative lecturers and aviation educators in general aviation, Brian Schiff sets a new standard in how we can all be better, safer, and more educated pilots. I am thrilled to call them both friends and cannot wait to jump into some hangar flying and a look back on the past year. And you're gonna bring them on the line right now. Please help me welcome to Social Flights Live, Barry, and Brian Schiff. How are you guys doing? Hey, good, Jeff. Good Howdy. Hey, me... I want to thank you for inviting me here, but I have to tell you that when I'm asked to come before an audience, it reminds me of when Orville Wright was asked to speak at the Wings Club in 1938, and he was prepared for this long speech. He gets up in front of the audience and he says, you know, parrots are the best of all talking birds but they don't fly worth a damn. And with that, he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> did Orville tell you that joke? <laughs> when I taught him to fly, he did. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, I'd like to start with uh, a bit of a, a round table here on what for each of you, the and, I, and I'll even chime in here as well, what for each of you the, um, kind of, I guess, biggest thing that you saw either in the news or that happened to you personally in 2023, looking back was, what's kind of most notable? And Barry, I'd like to start with you. Oh, well, I think to me, the most significant advancement made 
this year was when a company called Reliable Robotics got permission from the FAA to take off in a Cessna caravan without anybody on board, not even a pilot, and fly it around the Bay Area. And I think this is a prelude to things to come. Reduced uh, cockpit oh. crew members, uh, no crew members on board the airplane. And I think we're going to see some of that in the future. I just don't know when or how quickly, but it's going to happen. My wow. job is going away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read recently that they've even expanded beyond line of sight now um, package deliveries and things like that happening with UAVs. And uh, I, I think that's in your area, isn't it? They're, they're running some some deliveries going on now more and more down in, in the Texas area, especially in Dallas. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it yet. It's uh, uh, what it's could below, possibly go wrong? Beyond line of sight. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's, it's crazy. When they uh, talk, people are, are saying that they'd be afraid to fly on board an aircraft without a pilot. But when you think about the aircraft, the drones that are being flown halfway around the world, carrying munitions and dropping them accurately on their targets, you got to realize this is this is this is the future. This is what's coming. Uh, and if they can send a vehicle to Mars and land it on a given spot. Flying an airplane across country would be pretty easy without a pilot. Interesting. Yeah. The computers yeah, don't get scared. <laughs> that's good or bad. I don't know. Don't you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, how about you? What, Jeff? How about you, Brian? Well, I think... Uh, I think the biggest, as far as the advancements go, what I'm seeing in, in autonomy and in, in, in next gen uh, ADSB, what we're seeing at the airline level is fantastic, and I think we're going to start to see it more at general aviation level. But we're seeing some things where we can tag aircraft and maintain automatic spacing behind them. ATC can say maintain 120 seconds in trail of that aircraft, and we'll program that in there, and the aircraft will will, will do that. Um, we're, we're seeing some visual approaches where you don't have to see the other aircraft. You do a, a, a cockpit display of traffic information, assisted visual approach. So you tag them on the, uh, basically on your ADSB and follow them into the airport and maintain your separation that way. And, and there's, there's some incredible technology to that. I, I just think it's amazing some of the things we're seeing there. Um, it's a little scary and amazing at the same time because I hate to become complacent. Uh, I also think it's important to look out the window uh, and we're getting away from that. Don't don't you think we have to put that in the Sadabria? <laughs> it would have to be from behind. It, you know, people, <laughs> I don't know that I could keep up with anybody in the Sadabria. So yeah, there's a lot of like interesting technology. And well, speaking of the Sadabria, you're actually mounting some Uavionics equipment in there, right? So there's it's it's crazy all the new stuff that's coming out. It's amazing. I put the two avionics uh, AV30s in there and the, the amount of information available and I'm, I'm comparing it to the analog gauges and it's identical. Uh, I never used to have, like if you go out on a dark night or a hazy day and you lose a horizon in my Satabria before that, I mean here we've got uh, AHAR's attitude indicator now. I've got air data going into there. I can got my ground speed. I got outside air time, everything right there. And, I, and, and the the beauty of it is you can modify it and you can change it to the information you want and you can change your instrument for, well, I'm going to do VFR sightseeing. So I want certain parameters on the instrument for sightseeing. And then I can put it into a cross country mode. Here's what I want for cross country flying. And at the push mm -hmm. of a button, you're looking at a different kind of, uh, of instrument dependent on the kind of flying you're doing. That's amazing. That's... What has happened with flying with a compass and a clock? <laughs> People don't get lost anymore. <laughs> That's no fun. Right. Yeah, you told me that you had to land somewhere and buy fuel so that you could look at the receipt and know where you are. <laughs> That's how I find out where I am, by looking at the receipt. <laughs> well, gone are those days. Oh, uh, yeah, but they were fun. You never knew who you were going to meet when you landed at a place you didn't know where you were landing. That's true. <laughs> That's true. I've met the best and most fun people. I think, Jeff, you did that, too, and you and your boys went flying uh, to different airports and I think the people that you met was the funnest part of that. Oh my god it it, it truly was I mean no, there's just no question about it I mean the coolest trip that I, I can say we we in our whole lives that we've ever done 
is one that we made a video series on called No Magenta Line. I love and that. In this series, I would encourage anyone to do this. You talk about something anyone can do. This is something anyone can do who flies. We had no destination. We literally said, we're going to go away for a week. Where are we going to go? We have no idea. And the only rule was we never were putting a destination into our navigation. We literally were flying, you know, we're in New England, so we were going to fly generally in the southwestern direction and just look at the towns from above, be, be advised for airspace and things like that. But other than that, look at the towns from above and see what looked cool to land at. And that's where we stayed the night, whatever looked cool. And it was an adventure that I, I, we ended up skydiving and, and spelunking and, and caves and doing so many cool things because everywhere we landed, people were, we just met these amazing people in general aviation and they all ended up doing cool things with us. So it was, uh, it was really, really wonderful. You're right, it's all about the people. That's really neat. I, I wish I could do that. And I, I, my son and I are going to try it and I hope I can do it and just get in and go somewhere without a plan. I've just never been able to, to do that yet, but I want to, cause that sounds like a lot of fun trip because you, you plan something and you're just basically excluding everything else that could happen. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, that's, it's that's amazing. Too cool. yeah. I, have to um, tell you, I had a, had an incredible flight across the country some years ago when I was uh, collecting airplanes, meaning, flying different kinds of airplanes. I uh, wrote in my column that, uh, are there any folks out there who want to let me fly their airplanes? Especially Ooh. ones I hadn't flown before. And I received quite a bit of mail. And I plotted it out on a chart, what it would take for me to fly all those airplanes and stop at all those airports. And I did it. I flew around the country in the Cessna Skyline and met, met some great people, and flew some wonderful airplanes. That's how I can catch up to you. While I'm on social flight, I'll make a plea to somebody to help me fly their airplane. I'm only flown 100 kinds. What have you flown? Almost 400? Well, Jeff said 355. He was off by eight. 363. <laughs> I want credit for those eight. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's restart, everybody. With 28,000 hours, more than 28,000 hours logged and more than three. <laughs> yeah, I've just cracked 100. So um, well, I I'm going to when I only flew a hundred. You cracked a hundred. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. A lot of airplanes. What was your most memorable of those airplanes? Yeah. Me or Dad? Well, I'm going to start with you, Brian. Uh, the Stearman, and, and that only happened recently. Going up in a Stearman was just a blast to the past. You're outside. Uh, that airplane was just so peaceful and graceful, and I just felt nostalgic when I flew it. It was just so awesome. The, the, probably the, that, that was the most impactful to me to fly something like that. And Barry, what was the one that you remember being the most amazing aircraft you've flown or most memorable is a better word? Well, the most memorable wasn't necessarily the most fun. It was getting a sort of a semi checkout in a U-2, a high flight in a U-2. Oh, the who Air hasn't Force, flown the U-2? The Air Force, uh, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Who hasn't flown the U-2? <laughs> yeah, well, I got a couple hours of dual in one up to 75,000 feet. And uh, that was the most remarkable flight of my career. Uh, looking down at the contrails that Brian puts out in his Airbus. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's nothing, right? Watching the curvature of the earth, looking straight up and seeing pretty dark sky in the middle of the day. It was really re incredible. And wearing a uh, 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 pressure suit and uh, having, wow. to, having to go through a, a pressure chamber where that thing blows up on you. It, uh, it was remarkable training, a remarkable flight, one that I'll never, ever forget. It, it wasn't the most fun, but it was the most uh, memorable, to be sure. Wow. And cool. what would you say was the most fun? Uh, my Aronka champ flying at sunset with girlfriends in high school. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> I remember having uh, the, the, the family Satari up at college one time, and I remember flying it out to Pismo Beach from, I went to San Jose State. We flew out to Pismo Beach, and you can carry your camping gear, walk out to the beach, go camping, and uh, you know, right there on the beach. So flying to camping was a lot of fun, something that I really enjoyed doing too.
And what, what type of aircraft was that? That was in a Cetabria. Ah. Yeah. So and soloing, soloing Brian was a pretty fun flight too. Tell me about that. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> uh, no, Brian was really great. We had a wonderful time on his 16th birthday. He was ready for solo long before that, but he wasn't old enough to solo. And so uh, what did we do? We went out and got you to solo on the same day that you went out and got your driver's license. That was great. Yeah, but it was important to solo before I got the driver's license. And it was, <laughs> you know, I tell my students who have a hard time soloing in, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 hours, I tell them, look, I had 150 hours when I soloed, so don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah, but it was nice getting him out of the airplane and, and getting to fly, and I I really got to see some serious performance in that airplane after you know you you, you cut the payload in half like that or more at the time, but uh, it was a lot of fun, and thus began the me attempting to ride his coattails and the beginning of my imposter syndrome career. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't fun. describe it anything like that. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a hard act to follow. Uh, that that is that's definitely true. Um, so I, I want to uh, wrap up as we go kind of around the horn a little bit. One of the things that comes to mind out of 2023, and I just want to do some justice to because we were all we all knew some of these people, um, was it seems like it was a bit of a, a year of loss in some ways. And uh, we had three folks that were guests here on Social Flight Live, friends of all of us. Um, that passed away. Uh, Treat Williams uh, passed away. Brian Shule, the SR-71 pilot and also a uh, renowned fighter pilot from Vietnam, um, passed away. And and also Richard Mixbatten uh, passed away. And I uh, was wondering if any of you had some thoughts or some other folks to, to add to that, because uh, I think we lost some incredible, incredible people in general aviation during 2023. Oh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Buffett, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So true. Yeah, that was a tough year. It seemed like every time we're turning around, we lost somebody else. And it, it's supposed to be the rule of threes, but uh, it, it's equally sad when we lose someone that you didn't know or wasn't that famous. And it, it's tough how many, you know, I don't know if we're hearing about it more because of social media and how readily available information is, or if it's happening more. Either way, I don't know. It, it, it's just, it's tough to hear of these things. And, you know, when, when I heard of, you know, Richard McSpadden's accident, it really made me, it hit me hard. It was a very mm. difficult one to accept. Uh, but, you know, I think we, 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 we need, and I think he would want us to take away from that, that, hey, you know, we need to be safe pilots. Anything, it can happen to anybody, you know? Well, I don't think any of us are immune to an accident or a problem with an airplane that we have to cope with. Uh, I think it's important to realize, and a lot of people are going to fight me on this, but I can prove it. Flying a light airplane is more dangerous than driving a car. And I don't really care what other people have to say about it, and I can prove it. And here's the proof. We know a lot of people who drive automobiles, and damn few people who've been killed in those automobiles. Yet we know fewer people who fly airplanes, and know more people who've been killed in them. This mm -hmm. goes to show you how careful we really have to be. And the safety of flight depends on us, the pilots. It's important yeah. that we fly safely. Yeah. Well, I would agree that, that flying is, is only as safe as the pilot makes it. it. It can be very safe if the pilot makes it that way. Or it could, it could be very hazardous or dangerous if the pilot makes it that way. But I think it's important for us to look at what has happened and, and, and let it serve as a wake-up call that, hey, this can happen to any of us and we need to take every precaution we can to become the best and most safe pilots that we can. Yeah. And I, I want to add some, someone else chimed in, which I think is, is really uh, helpful as well. We've had Ariel Tweedo on the show um, and uh, she'll be coming back on in the future. And her father, Jim Tweedo, um, who also passed away uh, uh, this year. So it was, yeah, it, it was at least for, for people whose, whose names so many recognize um, it seems like there was quite a bit of, of loss in 23, and so I just want to put kind of our thoughts out to, to the families and to, and to everyone who, who, lost, uh, who lost loved ones as part of, as part of this. Um, both of you are really renowned having to do with safety and education and known uh, in the industry. 
one of the things that occurs to me is that the the it's it, it's been said before and i kind of feel this way personally the more experience we get the older we get the less risk we tend to be willing to take what i'll, I'll start barry with you what kind of lessons do you think come out of that where uh, experience seems to lead to less higher minimums not flying as much at night single engine things like that whatever people change whatever their their personal things are well since I've been flying since I taught Doolittle to fly <laughs> I can tell you that when you start flying you have this little yellow streak up and down your back it's pretty narrow and as you become older and more experienced, that yellow streak gets wider and more intense. And you're willing to take fewer chances as you get older, which in a way I think makes older pilots uh, in some ways safer than young ones. Yeah, I would buy that. I think that uh, the, the more experienced you are, the more you learn what can happen. The more experienced you are, the more lucky events you've had and gotten away with and realize, holy cow, I'm never doing that again. The older you get, the more life events you have. Like when I, I think the biggest turnover for me, that yellow stripe down my back made the biggest jump in width when I had children because mm. I, ma I mattered more to, to more really to somebody. And, and I, I took that seriously. I didn't want to orphan those children. And so I took it very seriously. And I think when with every life event like that, when you become more important to somebody, when you realize how lucky you were on a def different occasion, and when you learn all the things that can happen, you become more, I don't want to say afraid, but you're aware of things that can happen. And I think that makes you a safer pilot because you try to mitigate those things. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, Good I point. definitely got more concerned when you had children. So uh, <laughs> Good I, point. I get <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, right. Completely. It's it's interesting because, again, another theme from 2023, it's interesting that we can look at that and see that we all take fewer risks with all that experience. And yet uh, it seems that age is becoming more of a problem in general aviation, that people are getting pushed out of certain aircraft, can't get insurance. Um, so it sort of seems like there's these two separate you know things happening more experience uh, less risk and uh an insurance company saying we don't want anything to do with you at the same time um that's very strange what are your thoughts on that barry well i think insurance companies are going a bit too far um i'm a member of an organization called the ufos which is mm -hmm. the united flying octogenarians yeah i'm 85. anyway i know a lot of guys over 80 obviously and you'd be amazed how many of them are no longer allowed to rent an airplane such as a 172 during daylight VFR conditions. I've had rent. Rent. They are not allowed to rent one unless there's an instructor on board, which is like being a student pilot all over again. I've had a fellow write to me that at age 70, he was about to buy a Navy on. And because it had retractable gear, they would not rent, uh, would not uh, offer insurance to him. Um, Jim Brolin, uh, the actor, he's uh, he's married to uh, Barbara Streisand, has been flying a Cessna 180 all of his life. A great Cessna 180 pilot. He knows how to fly tail draggers. He turned 80. Insurance company canceled it. And yet they'll insure a student pilot in that Cessna 180. And who would you rather have fly you? in that airplane. It's interesting that at the airlines, we have a program now called fatigue risk management, and they talk about fatigue and how it affects everybody. Now there are all kinds of things that can affect you to make things go wrong, uh, whether you're sick and all that thing. But one of the things they say in there that kind of hit home on this topic is that experienced pilots make up for those shortcomings because of their experience. It, it fills the void for like you could, like a, a very experienced pilot who is fatigued is going to be much better than a brand new pilot who is fatigued because the experience makes up for that fatigue or, or whatever shortcoming you're having. So the experience means a lot. And, and that muscle memory, the second natureness of flying an airplane, I, I just think they're neglecting that when they make such decisions. On the other hand, when you're older, you know better than to fly when you're fatigued. 
Uh, <laughs> That's I, true. You know, it's, it's very, very true. Well, one of the things that it's interesting, we, we talk about experience, and uh, I, I know, Brian, you've helped me out recently when I've, I've called you with different questions and, and situations. And the idea of knowing what it's like to cancel a flight for the right reasons, that in itself is an experience that I don't think a lot of students get, meaning they get the, the idea of you go somewhere, you need to come home, uh, and then the weather just doesn't look right, and you've had the experience of not doing it, knowing what it's like to cancel and stay an extra day, and that the world doesn't end, and you can watch the weather and realize that you're grateful you actually weren't up in it. That seems to take experience, to not just to get there uh, and make those decisions, but to, to have a memory of making good decisions. Any Any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and I was rewarded and praised by dad when I made decisions like that. In fact, one such time, he, he I think he wrote a column about that, uh, about the best flight I ever had was the one I didn't take because I made the right decision. And, and I think he wrote that piece on decision making, which reinforced in me the decision that not every flight is a go. And I have told my students or my uh clients who will want a flight review or an instrument proficiency check that, hey, anytime you're somewhere and you're thinking, should I or shouldn't I, call me. I don't care what time of day it is. Let me be a mentor. I think every one of us should have someone like that in our phone that we call when we're, we're about to make a dumb decision and, and get their, their viewpoint on it. You know, this uh, reminds me of a flight I had. Uh, I wrote about this not too long ago. I uh, was down in uh, East Africa flying with a good friend of mine, a doctor. Uh, we had our wives with us. And we were headed toward the uh, Mount Kenya Safari Club flying the Cessna Arrow. And we had paid our res paid for our uh, accommodations in advance. A very ritzy, pricey place, mind you. And we were headed there, and we got some bad weather in the way. And, and I saw where I thought we could get through it. And Frank Taylor, the doctor, uh, my friend, said to me, in a very avuncular way, he puts his hand on my shoulder. And he said, Barry, let's not go. And I said, what do you mean? We gotta go, we paid for it. And he said, you know something, if we don't make it, if we don't get there, if we don't go, in five years or so, we'll never know the difference. As what does a matter avuncular of fact, mean? That applies to, it. pardon? What does avuncular mean? Uncle-like. Oh, uncle-like. Uncle-like, <laughs> avuncular. Okay. And anyway, the lesson was so, so it hit home. It hit home because from then on, I realized there is no flight so important that it's going to matter five years from now if we don't go. It's an excellent, I, I love both of those points. I love that, that thinking of it that way. And I am, I'm really loving the idea of having a mentor that you call to get, to, to bounce something off of. That's and if you not want to tested. Tell both, if you want to tell both of your viewers my cell phone number, they can call me too. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's sort of like airline pilots who have dispatchers. It's right. sort of like a partner in crime who helps them make the proper decisions. They're not always there to make them, but the dispatchers in a way are, would be nice to have them in general aviation, people who can help uh, decide whether a pilot should go or not. Yeah. It's, it's, I love the idea. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, this is top of mind for me. We had a flight recently that went to uh, Laconia to go to a concert. You can walk to a concert venue from Laconia. We went there on the way back, fog was, and, and low visibility was coming in and it was night and it wasn't forecast. It just happened. And um, really was sitting there with the get home itis trying to make a decision, ended up deciding not going to do it, you know, get an Uber, get a hotel room, put really inconvenienced everyone who was in the group. But the next morning, <laughs> on the, as we got back to the airport, found out on the news that it had gotten really bad very quickly. And uh, an aircraft had crashed trying to get into a small Cessna, crashed trying to get into that airport at night. And I look back on that now as one of the most impactful flights uh, uh, that never happened because that that's top of mind. I don't think I would have thought that way at 20, but um, I certainly think that way now of like, wow, 
that was the biggest experience I had to not go and be so grateful I made the decision. Jeff, that's because at 20, we're immortal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Think about it. Yes, yes, very much so. Yeah, I have more stories like that of canceling, <clears throat> staying behind. Sorry, I poured coffee down my throat. Than I have of getting into hairy, sticky situations. That's well. That's because you make very, very good decisions. So that's well. I think I was rewarded by making those good decisions a long time ago. And I think had I not been, I might <clears throat> excuse me, make them differently today. So, yeah. Um, another, if we look back, uh, a few other things have happened this this year. Certainly, um, the one of them recently was in the news. The FAA announced a new advisory panel to evaluate their policies on mental health issues, and it kind of touches on this whole concept that um, it seems pilots as a whole are afraid of their medicals and how they're handled. And so the FAA seems shocked that a survey came back and said pilots don't want to tell you or they want to seek medical care when they have a problem and don't want to tell you much about that. Should we I look into why. this? <laughs> yeah, I wonder why, yeah, the FAA, what could possibly go wrong with the uh, FAA yeah. in the city looking at, into what your medical issues are? <laughs> yeah, it seems that we have created or, or the FAA has created this world now where um, you either know you have this group of people of don't ask, don't tell, or don't say anything. And then anyone that they get information about, they're digging in deep and it can be very difficult. Any, any thoughts about uh, kind of <clears throat> about this or what, uh, what you've either read about or what you're looking forward to in the future having to do with this? Well, I have never, ever, ever denied having a problem with my medical condition, ever on a medical application, not ever. So I'm not qualified to discuss it. Yeah, <laughs> I think I see a lot of pilots who are friends who are afraid to put things down uh, or answer. Even going to a doctor, have you ever felt this and you're filling out the questionnaire of the 10, 20 pages you've got to fill out ahead of time? And I've even had some things where I'm like, I don't want to put this on the record. I don't know what the FAA is going to see or when or what they're going to consider. So when I was younger, <clears throat> I put down the first time I put on an FAA medical that I had asthma, for example, they, I get this certified letter in the mail from the FAA saying, your medical's still good, but we're looking into this. And that's frightening. Yeah. And that's scary. And so the FAA has created this, um, you know, a world where everybody's afraid to get medical attention because they don't know what the FAA is going to do about it. I'm glad to see <clears throat> that they're taking this seriously and making it easier for pilots to get medical attention without reprisal of losing their, their certificates. The, at the, I know AOPA, is pro, they're, they're probably got a really good program for uh, giving pilot advice on, on aeromedical issues <clears throat> that kind of emulates a program that the airlines have. My airline has one that uh, uh, is pilots and peers in the union helping you with aeromedical issues or, or if there's something that you're just concerned about that you just don't want on the record somewhere, you want to find out if it's okay if it's on the record, you go to them and talk to them and, and, and very well-educated people will help you through that. I yeah. like to see that in GA, the FAA is coming around for that. I hope this panel does something to make it easier. I, I, I do too. I think one of the things that is, uh, I know that they are at least looking into, I don't know what progress they'll make, but the, the least looking into at Oshkosh at AirVenture this year, they uh, did a study with some pilots because um, one, one of the challenges is anytime anyone is diagnosed with anything or has anything show up on medical, then you are now in the situation of proving you're perfect, you're okay, or proving that whatever, that you're perfect. And yeah. um, there are some of these things that, you know, doctors have told me in the past that uh, you, that the average person couldn't necessarily get through. And so they ran a test at, at AirVenture with what they do for mental health and are testing random pilots uh, uh, in, in that is uh, done anonymously to see how do does the average pilot do on tests that we administer to people we do have concerns about? Can and they all pass? And so it'll be interesting to see kind of how people how this happens. And we're like I said, we're hopeful that this will be a positive development. 
for general aviation in that area, but that's the that that's obviously the concern. I'm so not doing it, Oshkosh. You know, some years ago, uh, during one of my marriages, I had to go to a marriage counselor, which is a lot of guys have had to experience that at one time or another. And somehow or another, the FAA found out I went to a shrink uh, because of marriage counseling. And I got mm -hmm. a letter from the FAA and wanted to know what my mental condition was that drove me there. And when I explained it was because I was married, they, they understood. Um, and anyway, that, that solved, uh, solved the problem. But I was amazed that I would get a letter so quickly after a couple of visits to a marriage counselor. Yeah, that's and right. uh, and that's that that's some of the challenges. But again, that's a 2023 thing. They've done some. They've done that. They're doing some survey work. They're putting together a panel to take a look at it. Clearly, um, it just seems it seems to me that in many cases, whatever the health condition is, but certainly with mental health, that someone who is uh, seeking help and getting help and doing well is probably better in the cockpit than someone that isn't seeking help and is hiding whatever is going on for fear of the FAA. Exactly. That is so true. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I'm glad to see that that's happening too, because I'm having some dreams that, boy, I really... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Are you I'm having them again? <laughs> uh, this is real, by the way. Right now, this is not a dream. This is, this oh, is, actually, this is, is this okay. really happening? <laughs> wow, very cool. Well, the FAA is lightening up on a lot of things, which is nice to see. Like the compliance program, instead of just beating you and punishing you, it's like, okay, let's just train them, bring them back into compliance. Like that, I like that too. It's you're you're in the, in the medical <clears throat> field like this. They're not assuming you're unhealthy right off the bat. I hope that they will get to a point where they don't assume you're guilty before, and you got to prove yourself healthy. I'd like them to see, okay, here's something you're going to keep flying, but you know, if we prove that you are not, then we're going to stop. So. What is the compliance program? Well, the compliance, it, it's basically, it used to be that the FAA would violate you if you did something wrong. Now, mm -hmm. if you do okay. something wrong, they'll counsel you. They'll, I'm a FAA safety team representative. They'll find a rep like me to give remedial training and bring you back into compliance with the standards by which you were licensed or certificated. And, and so rather than just punish you, they say, okay, here's some training, take this course, fly with this instructor, uh, get some dual on that, and, and then you can, you're good to go again, rather than just removing your certificate for 120 days and punishing you. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Almost like an extension of sort of what they do with NASA program in a way. Um, yeah, sort of. <clears throat> well, I guess, well, a little bit of, I guess, caring about what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could get what you're talking about without any ramifications. I would like every time that there that there was a NASA form to have someone who's in not any way informed, having to do with enforcement in any way, to literally call you back just to chat and help you out. Jeff, I know pilots who file a NASA form after every flight. <laughs> yeah. I think an emergency before every flight. Yeah, it's before takeoff. That way it's done. <laughs> Uh, no, I think, and I think it's, you You know, pilots can reach out to FAA safety team personnel if they want that. Like you could, anybody, you could say, if you don't know somebody, you can reach out, look at the FAA website, look for an fasafety.gov website and look for a, a, a fast team representative and call them and talk to them. You can discuss those NASA reports that you filed and, and maybe get some feedback on that. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, so another topic that was big in 2023 were all sorts of things going around having to do with social media, et cetera. Brian, any thoughts on what what that impact was? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen some things that we we don't like. I think the the, the impact is I, I really get disappointed in seeing people or entities doing things for clickbait, for attention, for monetizing or getting a million views or likes or whatever. Uh, I, I think it's a big problem, not only in our social raising of our children these days, but here in aviation now, we've got a pilot who, uh, you know, jumped out of an airplane and intentionally crashed it and went to jail for trying to obstruct uh, justice on that, um, just in the interest of getting attention. And I, I, I think that's horrible. I think it does a disservice to aviation, uh, and, and I don't like seeing it. it it's very unfortunate. 
Uh, and I think the other thing that I've seen is that it brought to the surface something very, very bad in, I think, okay, most of our flight instructors are great. Most guys are doing a great job. Most pilots are doing a great job teaching. And this is the exception, not the rule, but that CFI that posted, that ridiculed his student on a night cross country. And then they both flew into a thunderstorm and perished. Mm. I mean, I don't, that was horrible. Yeah. And, but that brought to light that we've got some flight instructors out there acting very unprofessionally. And so as a board member of the National Association of Flight Instructors, I and my fellow board members are taking that very seriously and we're trying to put out information and programs to help instructors become more professional. So yes, it brought to light something, but it's a horrible thing to see. I, I don't like seeing people post things on social media uh, in the interest of gaining attention or clicks or something or money. Right. That's unfortunately kind of the, the world. It, it is, and it's very unfortunate. Oh, Barry, it looks like we may have lost your mic for a second. Do you hear him? This is how I usually heard him when I was growing up, just like <laughs> this. <laughs> I'd see his lips moving. I know that he was angry. I just didn't hear Try him. On Try unplugging it and plugging it back in. Yeah. Um, Brian, one of the things is, that uh, um, comes to mind with new developments, of course, is Mosaic. That, that's yeah. being. Um, I think that's a, a great, uh, one of the best things I've seen in 2023 is wow. in July when the FA introduced that. And I think it's still a notice of proposed rulemaking that um, they're they're going to modernize what a light sport aircraft is. They're going to bring it up to so that a lot of more aircraft can be light sports. Uh, the first time I flew a light sport, I thought, you got to be kidding me. This is what it's okay to fly without a medical. Um, they're very squirrely that because they're so light and the, and the wing loading, they're 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 difficult to fly at best. I mean, certainly more difficult than a 172. And now this mosaic, which I think, if anybody's wondering, is modernization of special airworthiness certification. So they're basically saying more airplanes. They're changing the definition of a light sport to include aircraft like 172s and stuff like that. And I think that's great because a 172 is certainly a lot easier to fly than the light sports I've flown. Have you, uh, in that long list of, of 363 aircraft, um, Barry, uh, what, have you flown light sports in that? I've flown a number of them. And frankly, I never met one I liked. Uh, I found <laughs> them to be, uh, I didn't like the wing loading on them. I didn't like the pitch control. They were too squirrely. And I always thought that we had better airplanes, safer airplanes, easier to fly airplanes that were a little heavier and didn't qualify as being light sport. And I'm delighted that now those airplanes, like a 172, will become uh, a light sport airplane. It deserves to be. It's easier and safer to fly uh, than most of those so-called light sport airplanes. Yeah, so before they had to be less than 1,320 pounds to qualify. So what did they do? They made all the switches, all the throttles, knobs. See, everything was as lightweight as possible. I felt like when I put the landing light on, I was going to break the switch. <laughs> it was so <laughs> frail and tiny, and I'm like, ooh, landing light on. Yeah, I didn't like that at all. The little tiny you know, landing but, gear wheels and stuff like that. Yeah, um, so what is it about that that makes it safer? I don't think that's it. So what they've done is, rather than the weight... They've, they've, they're making the weight limit based on stall speed. So I think it's 54 knots calibrated. Anything that stalls below 54 calibrated uh, can be uh, a light sport. And I think that's going to help a lot of pilots continue flying. I was uh, writing an article some years ago about a light sport airplane, and I didn't really like the pitch control at all. And I was asking the uh, manufacturer, I said, why is this thing so squirrely? Why don't we have a larger this, a larger that? Uh, why wasn't it improved? And he says, well, we can't afford the weight. Mm. And that was the big problem, was the weight of the airplane. Uh, you get yeah. an airplane like a 172, which is a little heavier, but it's a whole lot better flying machine than most of those light sports are. Yeah. Well, not, one of the nice things is it ties it all together with even what we were saying before about medical and other things, because, of course, basic med, 
and your ability to, to or even driver's license below basic med, um, it, it frees up, as you mentioned, it's not just about new pilots, it's about pilots being able to continue to fly. Right, exactly. Right. I, don't, I don't know what it's gonna do to the light sport manufacturers. Maybe they can change the way that they design the airplanes uh, to be a little bit more hardy, but, uh, and hopefully it doesn't hurt them too badly, but I think it's uh, a beautiful thing that you can now fly 172 in that same category with the same rules. Now it's still only one passenger, even though it has four seats, you can still only carry one passenger, I believe. Uh, yeah, I thought Mosaic went up. I I, I thought it was uh, allowing you up to six, uh, up up to six seat aircraft in that. I think a six seat airplane. But one the rules, the rules are not definite yet. Anyway, we haven't yeah. seen any final rules. I mean, this thing about the current light sports it, it was ridiculous. There were two models of the air coupe, for example. One was a few pounds over the rule and the other was a few pounds under. So you could fly the lighter one, which was not as good an airplane as the one that was heavier. It was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I think the new rule brings the actual, the reality of it into the spirit of the, the, the concept of a sport aircraft to get more people to fly, to be less dangerous or, or whatever. I, I just think that those light sport aircraft that were coming out are just, like we said, just nowhere near as simple, easy to fly, or stable as a 172. Well, yeah. what makes what is better about Mosaic is that the industry is being allowed to comment and contribute to the final regulations. The original light sport regulations were based on ICAO, the uh, light sport airplanes over in Europe, and we had to use their regulations. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's a that's a great precedence they're setting, looking to industry before they just whip out a regulation. That, that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. So, um, based on what you've seen in in twenty three so far, I'd I'd like to hear from each of you on kind of like what's top of mind on what's what's coming next for general aviation. What do you what do you see happening? And and since since you were forward looking at the very beginning, uh, Barry, with the uh, um, looking at at autonomous flight, what what do you think? What, what would you be painting the picture that you expect in the next year plus? Well, although you know I'm one who loves the sound of a piston engine, I love it. I don't like flipping a little switch and watching a fan come on and, and fly an electric airplane. I don't care for that at all. However, I think we're going to see a lot more electricity. What about a solar model airplane that sits on your desk? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, 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 how's, how's that? Yeah. Well, if, if I had one of those on my desk, Jeff, then... <laughs> Check the mailbox, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're going to see more electric airplanes. The only one that's certified here in the States right now is the uh, Pipistrel. And uh, you can fly it for a half an hour on the pattern. That's about it. You can't go anywhere in it. It just doesn't have the, the, the battery. I poo the electric cars when they came out. And they're coming along beautifully. And, they, you know, they're doing a great job. I mean, I think there's some fantastic electric cars. I don't have one yet. But the more I see them, the more impressed I am. So I'm going to stay open-minded about those electric airplanes. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense. So so electrification, electric aircraft. That's that's the biggest one for you, Brian. What uh, what's top of mind for you as to what's what's coming? Sky's the limit. <laughs> well, I think we're going to be pushing that limit uh, in, in aviation growth and how many people are getting into aviation. Uh, I think the interest is going to explode because of the barriers to entry, the barriers to remain in it. I think we're going to see record numbers of pilots learning to fly. I think that hopefully that will bring the cost down. Um, I'd like to see liability fixed, but I don't think that's ever, you know, the product liability costs and the lawsuits. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'd like to see that. Uh, the technology, the, the, so many cool things like the UAVionics I'm putting in my airplane. By the time I learn it all and start teaching it to people, there's going to be something even newer and greater there. So it's tough to keep up with it, but the technology that, that's coming out, uh, and most of which I think is going to increase the safety uh, of, of our industry. However, on that same note, I'd like to encourage everybody not to become complacent and reliant on that technology because we can all become autopilot junkies and automation junkies. It's really easy to do that. 
but that's what I see. I just see I just see our industry exploding with growth, and I'm being optimistic, but I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to see more pilots, more airplanes, and more airports. That makes it that's that's awesome. And when you when I think of you talking about technology, the first thing that comes to mind is your four flight workshops that you've been doing. <laughs> And I love that you've been doing that uh, in partnership with Social Flight, that we have your courses recorded on Social Flight available, and people can go there. They can get Wings credit. They can watch the courses and learn. Tell me what got you into this and what you're, what these are doing, because you're getting thousands of attendees at every yeah. one of your Four Flight Workshops uh, presentations, and you've had a lot of them going on so far. Yeah, I've done nine, well, this, Next month will be the ninth uh, <clears throat> workshop. We started back in May, and uh, this started, I mean, it's blown me away how popular it's been, and the, and the idea behind it is it's not just a webinar. Uh, I was teaching four flight classes in person back before COVID. I didn't do many webinars or online courses because I, like right here, I can't, I like to feed off the audience. I don't know what everybody, I, there, I can't, I could see a I would imagine people rolling their eyes right now. So I have to imagine <laughs> that like they always do when I'm talking. But when I was teaching in person, I would have a, a basically a syllabus that I, I would try to follow teaching for flight. And what would happen was people would ask, oh, well, but wait a minute, I, I want to ask about this. I want to ask about that. And I just had to throw away the syllabus because, okay, people want to know what they want to know. They have their questions. And so I said, all right. And I started this in person uh with uh for the 99s they were hosting some classes and i said let's have an in-person workshop i'm not going to plan a syllabus and we're not going to have death by powerpoint i'm just going to put i'm going to plan a flight we're going to start planning a flight from a to b using for flight and let's see what comes up let's all do it together it's a workshop i want to answer your questions as we work together and plan a flight and boy that became popular as an in-person class i mean it, it sold out it was just we didn't have room for everybody um, it, it was very popular. So I thought, okay, when COVID happened, I want to, I want to teach that now because I am studying for flight like crazy. It's an app. It's a new app every month, basically because of all their advancements. And so I took that to the, to the internet and, and I, I couldn't be happier with the, the success we're having. And I thank you for, for hosting them on, on social flight to, uh, so people can watch them and get Wings credit for it. But it's been a fantastic success so far, and I look forward to doing more of it. it it's, it's awesome. I know you're also working on expanding out, doing things like uh, training for UAVionics stuff, uh, some perhaps some other products and companies. And yes. uh, I, I just I can't get enough of it. I love watching uh, watching you speak and teach, and and uh, and so I'm I am grateful for that. So thank thanks for doing that. The yeah. ancient pelican here would like to make a comment. <laughs> the popularity of Brian's workshops is because four flight is so goddamn complicated. It's so <laughs> complex. And that's the problem with what's happening with a lot of avionics today. Every manufacturer comes out with his own black box that becomes increasingly more difficult to learn how to use. So complicated and so complex, you have to watch courses on the internet every week with Brian teaching. Thankfully, it's Brian because he does such a good job at it. But it used to be, hate to be an old fashioned, you know, fart like I am, but we used to crawl into an airplane, turn on the radio and go. We planned our flights with a yardstick on a map and drew a line and just went. Compass and clock navigation. Okay, I grant you, this stuff is really good. But sometimes this stuff goes too far. It's too complicated. It's too hard to learn in its entirety. I don't know anybody who knows how to use all of Four Flight except maybe Brian. I don't even know. I've had to call. I called the Four Flight and I said, "Could you please give your nerds about six months off for us so we can catch <laughs> up and learn this?" But no, you're absolutely right. I, I'm not going to disagree with you, Dad. I think that it be, has become so complex and. There are so many fantastic features of it, but how can anybody possibly know about all this? And then while you're flying is not the time to try to figure it out. So many people just don't try. Uh, they use the basic features and uh, they don't do it. We shouldn't have to have courses like this, but because of the complexity of this app, you're right. That's why it's such a huge success. Uh, right. But I don't think we're going to see a change in that. Uh, 
I'd like to see some standards in technology, in, in gestures and the way that we, you know, like Garmin, you turn the knob and push the button and you select cursors and other, other uh, uh, the, um, the one that you have, the IFD is so much simpler and, and uh, I think intuitive to use. The UAVionics coming out, I'm really looking forward to teaching some classes on that because it's not totally intuitive. But once you see what it does, you know, the videos and the, the workshops, a video is worth 10,000 words. You see somebody yeah. do it. And and then these workshops are driven by attendee content. I don't have an agenda totally in mind. When people ask questions, that's what I answer. We answer what the attendees are wanting to know. Yeah. Well, don't it's, you, it, it, don't it's you think, lesson. though, that there's something wrong with having to spend more time studying the black box than the airplane you're flying? But, uh, I think that's that's the blessing and the curse of the technology. You are absolutely right. You used to be able to get in, put you knew how to flip frequencies, and you knew how to how the needles worked, and the, you could go into any aircraft if you knew those things. And so some are steps forward, some come with steps back. And uh, yeah. but I think hopefully we'll get to a place where the simplicity continues to get better. And as you mentioned, um, we've seen that in navigators. We've seen them get harder and harder and harder to use, and then all of a sudden get a lot easier. Because I know when flying with the Avidon IFDs, and I'm quite sincere about this, all of a sudden they're so much easier. You don't have to spend time learning it. They've figured out how to make things intuitive, where they, where for a decade or more of, of a lot of those FMSs, they weren't intuitive. And so hopefully more and more of those things will become uh, intuitive. Um, yeah. I uh, Barry, I want to make sure also, because when we talk about 2023, I want to make sure we talk about something that is near and dear to my heart that I love. Um, and this this book that you've come out with, An Illustrated Guide to Flying by Barry Schiff. Love this. Um, it is a page turner, even though it's probably not for experienced pilots. It is, I think, something everyone should read. Well, thank you. Uh, the purpose in writing that book was to give to people you think might be interested in learning to fly so they'd get a taste of what's involved in learning to fly and get them enthusiastic and excited about it at the same time. I've actually had some experienced pilots write to me and tell me, hey, there's a lot of stuff in here I forgot. And uh, it's a fun book, a lot it of great it, it, it is. It is an extremely fun book. I will say that, no, no question about it. <laughs> I've been recommending it to my co-pilots who have kids that are becoming interested or they want to get them interested in flying. I'm like, hey, give them this book. And I, and I carry it with me. Can I show it to them? I'm like, oh, this is perfect. This is a great book to get them into flying. I think Christmas is coming up. So if you're watching this live. I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there might be a couple of people on this show that managed to, to find their way in there as well. So uh, I, I want to thank you for, uh, for including <laughs> that. <laughs> I know him. Exactly. I just want to point out, too, there's a guy out there named Lucas who's watching this show, and he's got a private pilot check ride tomorrow, and he's watching this in lieu of studying, and I hope that, uh, and I think he'll he'll smash his check ride tomorrow just because he's watching us tonight. That's, <laughs> Good that's luck. awesome. Yeah. Well, Barry, we have a very special treat tonight, and you are giving a gift to everyone, so uh, if you would like to introduce your uh, uh, little uh, what what you wrote many years ago tell us a little bit about this yeah I, I wrote a column in December of 2006 uh, a Christmas column and it, it it's something I'd like to read to you just an ex excerpt from it uh, it's my favorite Christmas story it was penned by best-selling author Frederick Forsyth and if you see me reading this is because it's the column that I wrote it's just a short paragraph and Frederick Forsyth is a famous author. He wrote The Day of the Jackal, The Odessa File, and The Dogs of War, and so forth. He wrote an aviation story. It's called The Shepherd. Don't forget that. The Shepherd. As a Christmas present for his wife, Carol, in 1975. The short page turner involves a Royal Air Force pilot flying a de Havilland vampire from Germany to his home in England at night on Christmas Eve, 1957. While over the North Sea, the pilot experiences total electrical failure, and fog has formed along the entire route. 
Bailing out into the frozen sea would be as certain a death as going down with the plane into fog over land. The pilot is concerned that this Christmas Eve is going to be his last. What happens next is what makes the tale so hauntingly powerful. This, my friends, is my holiday gift to you. Locate a copy of this small book. It's a fast page turner. You'll read it in less than an hour. And I know that you'll find the remarkable ending both beautiful and unforgettable. The Shepherd, don't miss it. And Merry Christmas. Well, Barry and Brian Schiff, thank you so, so much for joining us here this evening on Social Flight Live and Barry for giving us that gift of having everyone go and find the shepherd to read uh, for this holiday season as a little treat. Um, I am truly, truly grateful for the friendship of both of you and everything that you give to general aviation. So many lives touched by both of you. And I just want to say, say thank you for that and for coming on our show to look back on 2023 and wish us a good 2024. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure, really. Thank you. It has. Thank you for the invite. It's an honor to be here. I feel like among the, some of the people you've had here, uh, don't quite feel like I fit in, but it's a, it's, it's a pleasure. And thank you very much. Happy New Year to you as well. I'm very honored. And you two have a wonderful evening. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live and for everything over the past year in general aviation. I want to show again, um, if you are interested in supporting Social Flight, we have this wonderful, this it's all solid metal. It's, it's actually very, very heavy in my hands here. Uh, solar aircraft that sits on your desktop, um, has our logo on it, put a light near it, and it just uh, runs like that. Very, very cool and very nice. And if you're interested, just send an email to info, I-N-F-O, info at socialflight.com. I'll answer it personally and we'll get you a link that then um, you'll be able to help us all out. It's $99 plus shipping and it helps support us and, uh, and keep us doing everything that we can here at Social Flight. Until next time, again, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight and I wish you all blue skies. Thank you.